In 1912, in a Jesuit college 12 miles outside of Rome in Italy, one man struck a deal to buy a bargain box of old books from the school's library. The man was a book dealer who'd been travelling around Europe collecting as many rare and valuable books as he could. And so when he looked inside the box after returning to his shop in London, he couldn't believe his luck. Inside, amongst the dusty tomes he expected to see, was nestled an incredibly rare book, the likes of which he'd never encountered before. As soon as he began leafing through the ancient pages, he knew this text was something remarkable, yet undecipherable. And still to this day, the pages have kept their secrets, making the book one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of all time. Today on Macabre Mini Mysteries, we uncover the legend behind the world's most cryptic book, the Voynich Manuscript. Welcome back to another episode of Macabre Mini Mysteries. I'm Nikki Druce, your host with the silent G, and today I'll be taking you on a journey to uncover a macabre tale from around the world. And this time, it's another unsolved mystery which has baffled people for literally hundreds of years. Well, at least allegedly. And that's the Voynich Manuscript. However, before we get into today's episode, if you're new here and you want to see more videos where we deep dive into some lesser known historic tales from London's past, and in fact all over the world, then please don't forget to subscribe or follow so you never miss a new episode. If you aren't new here and you regularly enjoy the show and want it to continue, please consider supporting me and the content I make on Patreon. The link is in the show notes. The most recent filmed episode of Having a Problem is over there, as we're now filming the episodes, which is a lot of fun, and we're now up to eight episodes of the show, which is absolutely crazy, but we're really loving making it, and it seems our patrons are enjoying our stupid shenanigans, which is great. So if you want to see what it's all about, then please pop by Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash macabre London. It's all very reasonably priced and there's literally hours of bonus content over there. So why not take a look on patreon.com forward slash macabre London. I'd love to see you over there. In a dusty box of books in a bookshop in London, which specialised in dealing in rare books and manuscripts, a man was amazed to find that one of the books he'd purchased as part of a bundle deal was very unusual indeed. Unlike many of the other editions within the container, this item stood out. It was unlike the others, as it wasn't bound the way a book usually was, and the insides were all hand-drawn and painted. The plain cover didn't hint at all to the fantastical contents, and it seemed as if a notebook had been included as part of the deal. The man who discovered the book, Wilfred Voynich, had been on a tour of Europe looking for rare books to sell to his curious customers back in London. Voynich himself was no stranger to travel. He was born in Lithuania in 1865, which was then part of the Russian Empire, with the birth name Michael Habdank Voynich. He was born into a Polish-Lithuanian noble family and excelled in education, going to not one, but three universities in Warsaw, Moscow and St. Petersburg, where he studied pharmacology, graduating with his degree and licence as a pharmacist. At the age of 20, Voynich joined the proletariat revolution. Having been born into a noble family, this didn't mean he agreed with his roots. He didn't agree with everything the bourgeoisie were doing in Warsaw, and nor did he like the oppression of the common man. He was outcast from his family and fought alongside his friends to bring down the regime, 
However, when he was caught trying to free two imprisoned comrades of his who had been sentenced to death, he too was arrested, but more than likely as a result of his noble heritage, he was spared the death sentence. Instead, he was exiled to Siberia to live in a hard labour colony until such time as the state believed he'd learned his lesson, which may well have been for the rest of his life. However, Wilfred didn't accept his fate. He spent his whole time planning how to escape the Siberian tundra, and after three years, he managed to get away under the cover of darkness onto a train which took him to Hamburg in Germany. But Voynich felt this was still perilously close to his enemies, and he feared being recaptured, which would mean the end of his life. Instead, he spent the following few months making his way through Europe, eventually trading the hostile lands he'd once fought for in favour of the Sanctuary of London. By October of 1890, Voynich had settled into the city, moved in with some fellow Russian revolutionaries and became good friends with Sergei Stepniak, a Ukrainian revolutionary who had assassinated the head of the secret police, General Nikolai Mazentsov, in St. Petersburg in 1878. The revolutionaries banded together to create the Society of Friends for Russian Freedom and along with British and American allies, they, from a safe distance, spoke out against Tsarism, the absolute monarchy, which was ruling over the common man and killing millions of poor Russians via an economic crisis. The British branch of the Russian revolutionaries was, however, sadly stopped suddenly in its tracks when Sergei Stepniak, who was headed to a meeting near his home in Chiswick, climbed a stile to use a pedestrian crossing on a train track. Sergei didn't hear the warning whistle of the guard on duty to alert him to the approach of a thundering passenger train, or he chose to ignore it, thinking he had enough time to cross. Either way, he was sadly mown down by the train and his body was eviscerated. The collision killed Stepniak instantly, and in an ironic turn, he was sent on the London Necropolis Railway to be cremated at Brookwood Cemetery. At the station, his comrades came out in force to give him a proper send-off, and hundreds of people from all over Europe, who, just like Stepniak, settled in London, joined together to mourn the lost figurehead for many a displaced refugee. Stepniak's sudden passing marked a turning point for Voynich, He decided that even though Stepniak's demise wasn't related to the cause, he'd seen enough death to last him a lifetime, and so he decided it was time to close that particular chapter of his life and move on to the next. Using his skills he'd learned from his time in Serbia, Voynik began thinking about how he loved languages. During his time in the labour colony, he'd managed to learn 18 languages. He was nowhere near fluent in most of them, but he knew enough to get by. Even though Voynich had been operating in politically charged anarchic circles, that didn't mean he was the regular stereotype attributed to those kind of groups. He was eloquent and well-educated, and even though he was effectively the equivalent of a punk on the inside, he passed as a normie on the outside. Wilfred was friends with Richard Garnett, a curator at the British Museum, and Garnett encouraged Wilfred to go into antiquarian book dealing. After all, he had a penchant for languages and he could easily travel around Europe buying rare and sought-after tomes. Inspired by Garnet, Voynich began his book-dealing business and with his help, soon found he was skilled at locating books from a bygone era. Once things were going well, he set up his first bricks and mortar store in Soho Square in 1868. Word began spreading that Wilfred was the man to find the rarest books when he discovered an original Malermi Bible. Malermi is canonically believed to be the first translator of the Latin Bible to Italian, and as such, his books were the originator of the written word of God in Italy. So, a pretty good find on all accounts. A few years later, in 1902, Wilfred married a longtime friend turned lover and also revolutionary, Ethel Bull. Bull was such a cool lady and not your typical idea of a Victorian woman at all. Born in Cork in Ireland, she grew up in Lancashire in the north of England. She was the daughter of esteemed mathematician George Ball. Ethel trained as a musician. She was a successful author who wrote several books, her most popular being The Gadfly. She was a revolutionary sympathiser and she became so interested in being where the action was, she moved to Russia for a time. 
When she returned, she and Sergei Stepniak founded the Society of Friends of Russian Freedom, the irony being that she was Irish and he was Ukrainian. When Voynich joined the group, he and Ethel became an item not long after. However, Ethel couldn't be contained and their relationship was a bit fluid. Sort of. Well, at least she felt that way. I can't speak for Wilfred. She had an affair with an esteemed Russian spy early in the relationship and it's said that affair inspired her writing of The Gadfly. I don't have enough time today to go into Ethel's story completely, but I will leave a link in the sources so you can find out more about her, as she was a really interesting character and seemingly lived entirely by her own rules. So after Ethel and Voynich were married and the bookshop was going well for a number of years, he was getting more and more opportunities to travel abroad to collect rare books. He found Italy to be a particular hotbed of antiquities, and so he often visited. It was on one of these trips that he was invited to the Villa Mondragoni, a Jesuit college which had a dedicated library. They were looking to offload some of their old books, and as such, they sold a box of things which didn't fit within the library to Voynich. Within the box was hidden a book which was unlike any others. It was seemingly a personal notebook or handbook which had been produced with proper bookmaking materials and had been left in the box. It was clear to Voynich that this book was quite different to anything he'd seen before and that the language inside wasn't one of the 18 he knew how to speak. The book, which had a plain cover and no title, contained a multitude of illustrations, many botanical in nature, which led him to believe this may just be a gardener's manual. However, as he read on, he discovered the book was seemingly split into sections, and at least some of it was missing, around 30 pages or so. Now, the book is online, so you can be sure I have looked at every single page to see what it's all about. The book contains writing in an unknown language or alphabet, and contains many illustrations. The illustrations seem to correlate to the sections of the book and feature botanical drawings, astronomical star charts, and lots of women in various bodies of water living their best lives. And who can blame them? I personally love a bath as well. Inside the undecipherable tome, there were roughly 60 pages on plants. From what I can work out from the pictures alone, there is a kind of planting guide which correlates to the star charts. Then we head into bathing. Now, magic baths are a recognised thing throughout history, and particularly during the medieval times, which is when Voynich believed the book to have been written. Medieval bathing, contrary to popular belief, was a huge part of people's lives. Well, those who could afford the luxury of it, anyway. Communal bathing was carried out for a multitude of reasons. Firstly, it was a great way to keep up to date with local news and discuss the neighbours, and it provided healing properties. Staying clean helped to stave off a number of health conditions and warming waters did a lot to avail people's aches and pains and so taking the waters became very popular. In terms of magic and also religion, bathing was used to purify the body before prayer or a ritual and the term ablutions is still used to this day for purifying oneself before heading out into the world for the day. So it would make sense that there was a whole book created which was dedicated to this magical art of bodily purification. It seems the star charts within the book seem to say when to bathe and which plants to use in your magical bath to turn yourself into human tea. From what I can also decipher, it looks like the book tells you which baths to take and when according to your star sign. There are also seemingly a collection of birth charts which align to the astrological chart, something which was also big during the medieval times. Queen Elizabeth was a huge fan, and they took them very seriously. Dr John Dee, the original mage to the monarch, was key in creating star charts for old Lizzie, and if she was into it, you can sure as hell know it would have been all the rage for everyone else, as the reigning monarch, before the days of tabloid celebrities, ruled what was fashionable. Anyway, back to the book. The baths seem to be somewhat a cyclical thing. From the illustrations, it seems the plants grow, you use the stars to grow the plants, make sure they're planted at the right time of year, you then make a bath from the plants which will help you get pregnant. 
Then the bath water is used throughout the pregnancy to water women so they stay pregnant or so they get pregnant because that's how that works. And that water is then used in turn to fertilise the plants, which then the cattle eat and then they eat them and the whole cycle starts again. It's basically a medieval version of the Goop website and I'm surprised that Gwyneth Paltrow herself hasn't bought the rights to the book. As the manuscript was completely unintelligible, this made it very difficult for Voynich to find a buyer. If people couldn't understand the book, why would they want it? It held no value as a piece of text, unless it was for the novelty value. So, with this in mind, Voynich spent many years, and ultimately the rest of his life, trying to decipher not only the text, but also the origins of the book. By 1914, Wilfred and Ethel had been offered a shop in New York, and the pair couldn't pass up the opportunity – so they moved to the USA and set up shop on the other side of the pond. However, Voynich kept his shop in London, which had now relocated to 175 Piccadilly, the glass front of which is still preserved on the front left of the grandiose Piccadilly Arcade. Due to the First World War, Ethel and Wilfred were inclined to spend most of their time in New York, but Wilfred did still occasionally travel back to London and Europe to obtain more rare books. Voynich continued his task to decipher the ancient mysterious manuscript, and as he was quite obsessed with the book, he spoke to literally everyone he knew about it. Of course, a Russian revolutionary talking about a coded book during World War I didn't go unnoticed, and someone dobbed him into the authorities, thinking he may have been a spy. The authorities came knocking, but found that the book was harmless and that the other coded items Voynich had access to, or as part of his collection, were equally benign. As the years passed, Voynich became unwell. He developed lung cancer and passed away from the disease at the relatively young age of just 64. Ethel survived him, and in order to retire herself, she sold a lot of Voynich's books, including the fabled Voynich Manuscript. Ethel lived to 96 and died in New York, but after Wilfred's death, she wanted to part with the book, and when another rare book dealer came knocking, wanting to pick the metaphorical flesh from Wilfred's corpse, she sold him a lot of Wilfred's precious personal collection. That book dealer was Hans P. Kraus, a man who was known at the time for being the best rare books dealer in the world. He had heard about the manuscript from Voynich and he decided to purchase the book as somewhat of a novelty item in the hopes he could try to decipher it himself with his extensive knowledge of the written word. However, he was just as unsuccessful as Wilfred and he, in the end, decided that the text really should be somewhere where it could be officially studied. So with that in mind, he gifted the book to Yale in 1969, where it still lives to this day as part of the Beinecker Library, a depository for unusual and rare books. As a result of the interest in the manuscript and the multitudes of amateur codebreakers getting in touch, Yale decided to create a digitised version of the book, which can be viewed for free online. I've provided the link in my sources so you can give it a go if you fancy. Even if you don't want to have a go at breaking the code, it's still a very interesting object to view. And you know what would really help you to stay focused on the task in hand? A lovely shot of magic mind. Now, let me tell you, in this household, we've become obsessed with the power of this little transformative elixir that's become the unsung hero of my daily routine. Inside these pocket-sized focus-boosting shots are a specialised blend of nootropics and adaptogens, carefully crafted with ingredients like lion's mane, cordyceps mushrooms, matcha green tea, ashwagandha and a delightful blend of vitamins B, C and D, all with delightful tasting combinations of matcha and agave. These are the magic ingredients behind Magic Mind, which contribute to a perfect daily boost which really helps me to enhance my clarity and focus. Now, often a typical morning for me starts when I sit down to try and juggle the demands of the day and try to write a list, but it doesn't usually take me too long before I give in to procrastination, which means my script writing and my research doesn't get done. However, after I've had my shot of magic mind, I find procrastination has gone and I can calmly focus on getting my to-do list done. 
I drink Magic Mind alongside my regular coffee and by doing so, I've discovered the ideal balance of a caffeine kick and serene clarity. It's not just a productivity enhancer, it's a game changer. Magic Mind has proven itself as a reliable companion and I've been using it for a long while now. It provides the direct focus required to navigate through complex details, keeping distractions at bay. And it's not just about the workday. These shots have become my trusted sidekick during travelling and also in my spare time as they just make me feel like I can cope with my day much better and I know the vitamins in them are good for my overall health and I'll feel calmly energised and like my brain is firing on all cylinders all day without the inevitable crash an energy drink or too much coffee will give me. These small portable shots are designed for life on the go. Just pop one in your pocket and you're armed with a powerful focus boost whenever and wherever you need it. I only recommend and work with companies that I genuinely love so you know that Magic Mind has earned its place in my daily routine as I find it really works and it's definitely contributed to the creation of the episode you're currently enjoying. Seeing how well it works for me, I would really encourage you to try it out as well if you're having trouble being 100% on some days. It really has revolutionised my workday. Now here's the really exciting bit. You thought Magic Mind had given you some fab deals in the past. Well, this is a proper, proper discount, which you're just going to want to jump on straight away. If you're interested in trying Magic Mind for yourself, then you can get a whopping 50% off a subscription, which is the best deal, or 20% off your first one-time purchase by visiting the Magic Mind website at www.magicmind.com forward slash macabre London and use my offer code carb london the 50 percent off code is only valid for 10 days so if you want to get that 50 percent off and to try it for yourself to start on your better focus journey you'll have to be quick that's www.magicmind.com forward slash macabre london and use my offer code macabre london that's www.magicmind.com forward slash m-a-c-a-b-r-e-l-o-n D-O-N and use my offer code M-A-C-A-B-R-E-L-O-N-D-O-N. Make sure you're quick and get it before the 10 days runs out because I wouldn't want you to miss out on this one. Thanks for listening and supporting our sponsor and now let's get back to the episode. So now the book was in the best place it could be for the chances of the code being cracked. The studies on the manuscript began. Amongst many tests, the book underwent carbon dating to see when it was created. The vellum the text was written on was carbon dated to sometime during the 1400s. The pigments on the page were also tested. They were found to be a combination of high quality mineral inks, which contained materials used in the medieval times. The ink used to do the writing was iron gall ink, a material which spanned from the 5th century all the way to the present day, so the chance of pinpointing the date it was created was impossible. With materials revealed and dated, it was obvious that this was a book which had been created during the 1400s, or was it very skillfully made to look that way? So why would someone seemingly go out of their way to create a book which would have been very costly to produce and taken years to write in a language that only they could understand and for it to be about bathing according to your star sign? For that, we have to look at the theories behind who owned the book and where it may have come from. Firstly, the problem with the text is that it has never been decoded. If the book could be read, it would surely reveal its secrets, but the language is not known by anyone that has tried to study it. Many people have tried to find the correlation between the text and modern day languages, but the link cannot be made. This has led many to think the book is written in an ancient language which no longer exists. We know for certain that there are many dead languages out there which aren't spoken anymore. For example, Latin is the most well-known dead language, which isn't spoken as a mother tongue by anyone. It is still used because we know it exists, and it's mainly used in religious or scientific contexts. So if the language is dead, does it have any similarities to modern day languages? Well, some people have tried to make it fit. In particular, there is a big argument that this could be an Islamic language. 
but any time someone has tried to link it, the evidence falls down and the alphabet for the text cannot be produced. Others have tried to work out a cipher for the text attributing letters to the symbols, but the book still holds its secrets. Even the greatest codebreakers of all time, Alan Turing and Joan Clark, and the rest of the Bletchley Park Enigma codebreakers, couldn't work out the secrets to the book. Granted, their skill lay in numerical codes, but still, if they couldn't do it, it seems highly improbable anyone will manage it anytime soon. Even AI has been tasked with getting to the bottom of the code, and it cannot fathom it. So, if the code is completely indecipherable, who wrote the book in the first place, and how did they come up with something so impenetrable? When Voynich bought the book, he said it was accompanied by a letter, written in Latin, by Jan Marek Marcy, a Czech physician. In the letter, he said he'd been given the book by George Boresh, an antique dealer and alchemist from Prague. Boresh attributed the creation of the book to Roger Bacon, an English Franciscan monk. Bacon was a herbalist and doctor, so it stands to reason this could be his own coded version of Grey's Anatomy. The letter said, Reverend and distinguished sir, father in Christ, this book bequeathed to me by an intimate friend, I destined for you, my very dear Athanasius, as soon as it came into my possession, for I was convinced it could be read by no one except yourself. The former owner of this book once asked your opinion by letter, copying and sending you a portion of the book from which he believed you would be able to read the remainder, but he at that time refused to send the book itself. To his deciphering he devoted unflagging toil, as is apparent from attempts of his which I send you herewith, and he relinquished hope only with his life. But his toil was in vain, for such sphinxes as these obey, no one but their master, Kircher. Accept now this token, such as it is, and long overdue though it may be, of my affection for you, and burst through its bars, if there are any, with your wanted success. Dr. Raphael, tutor in the Bohemian language to Ferdinand III, the King of Bohemia, told me the said book had belonged to Emperor Rudolf, and that he presented the bearer who brought him the book 600 ducats. He believed the author was Roger Bacon, the Englishman. On this point I suspend judgment. It is your place to define for us what view we should take thereon, to whose favor and kindness I unreservedly commit myself and remain at the command of your reverence, Joannes Marcus Marcy of Cronland, Prague, August 19, 1666. That's weird. Was that just me? Or did that sound a lot like Gwyneth Paltrow to you? Hmm, maybe she's already bought the rights. So there are plenty of other theories surrounding the origins of the book. Da Vinci has been mentioned as a possibility for creating the manuscript and that the book was written by him when he was a boy, but... Eh, I don't buy that one. It's way too far from everything he went on to do. Also, when you look at his handwriting and the manuscript next to each other, da Vinci's handwriting has a far more fluid nature to it. Perhaps the most probable explanation is that this book belonged to Edward Kelly. Now, I have done an episode on John Dee before, and if you remember, Edward Kelly was his business associate, or perhaps most well-remembered for his breaking of their relationship for trying to steal John's wife by saying the angels that they used to communicate with asked them to swap their other halves. Now, if you haven't listened to that episode, and if you didn't, you should, you'll remember Kelly had derived along with John a language which they used to communicate with angels called Enochian. It's said that at one point, the Voynich manuscript was held with Dee's extensive personal library, which was his pride and joy. However, his personal library was stolen from his home in Mortlake over a period of several months when he went gallivanting in Prague to practice alchemy with Kelly. Now, it may have then been sold on during that time, or it could be that when Dee and Kelly were in Prague, they sold or gifted the book to George Beresh. However, John Dee's writing is far too messy for this, and Kelly's handwriting is far finer and smoother than the presented manuscript, which leads me to believe neither of them were capable of creating such an item. Now, it wouldn't be a good old-fashioned mystery unless we had some outlandish theories, so of course, let's get weird with it. Perhaps this is an ancient cosmic text written by aliens and left on Earth. 
Some people believe an alien landed, documented their life here on Earth in their own language, and then they expired, leaving their diaries behind. This may explain the fascination with unusual plants, or perhaps the plants are from their home planet, and maybe the text is trying to work out how to farm humans. I said it is a theory, I didn't say it's a good one. Of course, this could be a parallel universe item. Maybe the book somehow managed to travel with another being from a parallel universe where they speak a different language. And then the book got left behind. Another slightly plausible theory is that this is somewhat of a tripper's guide to hallucinogenic plants. It could be that this is a trip notebook from someone interested in consuming hallucinogenic plants, but the book is far too neat for this to be written by someone drug-addled, and the chapters and consistency don't point to that at all. We could continue down the arm of bizarre theories, but there are loads out there, and if we did, we'd be here all day. But there's just a few of the weirder ones for you to consider. My personal odd theory is that this is Bigfoot's recipe book, and it was left outside and someone stole it. Poor Bigfoot, how are they going to know how to make woman soup now? So, if the book is not related to any languages, can't be read by codebreakers, contains plants which don't exist, and can't be traced to one starting point, maybe it's all an elaborate hoax. Perhaps the call is coming from inside the building. Of course, our theory has to come full circle, and I hate to be the one to say it, but whoever smelt it, dealt it. Wilfred Voynick himself may well have been the creator of the tome. When trying to establish his business as a rare books dealer, what better than to have the rarest book of all? A single copy of a book that is a mystery, and will continue to make sure your name is remembered for many years to come. Now again, looking at handwriting the similarity of Voynich's nines to one of the symbols in the manuscript is uncanny. So either this is a huge coincidence, or the book is a big fat phony. Now interestingly, records show that while Voynich was picking up books from the Mondragoni, he also purchased a quantity of blank vellum. The books Voynich also purchased at the same time were all marked with book plates which said they belonged to the Mondragoni, but the Voynich doesn't have one of those. Another thing to note is that after Voynich returned from Italy with his newly purchased old books, records show that he and a friend made several trips to the British Library, and the books they referenced were ones on medieval painting, particularly in regards to the pigments and how to make them. The plot thickens. As if we didn't need any more fingers to point, Wilfred said he bought the book in 1912, but he didn't actually show it to anyone until 1915. Voynich's friend, Richard Garnett, who was a writer himself, had a fondness for astrology and would write about it often. He died before the Voynich manuscript was found, however, but that doesn't mean he didn't inspire Voynich to create the world's rarest book. So why would Voynich think to do this in the first place? Well, it's believed Jan Marek's letter that he found tucked inside one of the purchased books from the Mondragoni, which said about a text like this, may have given Voynich food for thought, and so he was inspired to create the book off the back of the letter. But if the book is new, then why does the carbon dating say it's so old? Well, the vellum purchased by Voynich probably was very old. I'm sure somewhere in your home you have an old blank notebook lying around, but if you were to carbon date that notebook, it would date to when it was created. It could well be that elements of the paper are quite old, and carbon dating isn't an exact science. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that just because you write on something that's hundreds of years old, that doesn't miraculously make it brand new. It would still test as being very old. As for the mineral pigments, these would have been contaminated with the elements of the vellum, and as such, they would date the same. And the recipe used in the inks did correlate to the medieval recipes, but that could have been replicated at the time the book was discovered. So the brains at Beinecker themselves have theorised about the book, and they state about the document that they believe now, again this is not fact, this is a theory, that the book belonged to Dr John Dee 
He sold it to a Roman emperor, Rudolf II, in 1586. Rudolf then gave the book to his family physician, Jacobus Sinapius, on account of the book being some kind of herbalist slash biological handbook. It then goes to Jan Marek Marcy, who was the one who said it was written by Roger Bacon. It is then sold to Athanasius Kircher in the 1600s, who keeps it at the Villa Mondragoni, adding it to their library. It then sat there for a few hundred years, before Voynich bought it in 1912. So that's the official academic line on the book, and I respect that, but I can't help but think this is just a fantastic piece of forgery. There are no mistakes or errors in the book. This is unusual. Now, this is where I get to share with you something I adore, and that's medieval marginalia. Often used to cover up mistakes, scribes used to ask artists to cover up their errors in books by creating drawings which would cover them. If you've ever wondered why sometimes a huge adorned capital letter appears somewhere on an ancient text, this is the medieval equivalent of Tipex. Now, I'm aware this won't work for those of you listening to this episode, but I can't resist an opportunity like this, so here's a short gallery of my favourite olden days notebook scribbles. they all absolutely wonderful. Anyway, my point is either the Voynich manuscript was written by someone who'd meticulously written out their work before committing it to vellum, or maybe this is something which was never meant to make sense. So there can be no mistakes in a sea of utter nonsense. So where does this leave us? Well, even nowadays, people are still trying to figure out the meaning behind the book. AI is still being used to still try and break the supposed code, and many people have this as their hobby, if Reddit is anything to go by. If you're so inclined to give it a go, as I said, I've left the link for the digitised version in the show notes, so you can relax tonight and see if you can break a centuries-old mystery. And if you do, I call dibs on getting the exclusive. Despite extensive efforts by scholars and cryptographers, the elusive nature of the meaning of the manuscript persists, leaving its pages shrouded in an air of unresolved intrigue. As technology advances and new methods emerge, there is a glimmer of hope for future breakthroughs in decoding the Voynich manuscript, unlocking the secrets hidden within its cryptic pages. Until then, the manuscript continues to be a captivating enigma, full of frustration as it steadfastly holds its secrets, defying people for centuries. One day, the Voynich manuscript may finally reveal its secrets, sharing with us the knowledge held within its pages. Imagine if it is literally all about making tea from pregnant women. How would we feel then? Surprised? Let down? Or maybe it will unlock a literary portal, which will bring the end of humanity as we know it. In either case, perhaps it's best if this remains a macabre mini-mystery. Thanks for joining me for this episode. I hope you'll agree that this is a really fun mystery and I don't know about you, but I hope in a way that it doesn't get solved as I fear the truth that it is simply just a hoax. But in the meanwhile, it's fun to speculate that this might be something more than that. Let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments on YouTube or on the case file post on my Instagram. If you enjoyed that episode and you want more of them, then you can support me in a variety of ways, including signing up to my Patreon, using the thanks button on YouTube, heading to my coffee page, or checking out my Amazon wishlist. Christmas is coming up after all, if you want to get me a little gift, or buying some merch. I also have my PayPal link if you just want to bung me a couple of quid to say thanks, and all donations go straight back into making the show. 
If you head to the support me section in the show notes on the podcast or just click on the video info on YouTube, then everything you need is there. And it's not all about money, sharing the show around on social media, telling your friends, the librarian or your local rare book dealer about the show all really helps me out. Leaving a five star review is a wonderful help for me. A comment, a thumbs up, follow, subscribe, all of that fun stuff, which is all 100% free, is more useful than you know and helps the show to grow our lovable gang of ghouls, which will allow me in the long run to bring you more of the haunted history we both love. A big thanks to my top tier legendary executive Patreon producers, Amy, Christina, Christoph, Kate, Kevin, Lisa, Mary, Meg, Rose, Sally, Sam, Sarah, Teresa, Terry, V and Veronica, and all of our other patrons too. If you'd also like your name read out by me at the end of every episode or your name in the show notes, then make sure you check out my Patreon where you can also get exclusive episodes, like the filmed version of Having a Problem, where we have a general chit chat about a topic once a fortnight, the most recent one was spiders. If you don't like spiders, probably don't watch the video version, but they're loads of fun and I think you'll really like them. And as Christmas is coming up, you could potentially pop it on your Christmas list as an interesting gift. So I hope to see you over there at patreon.com forward slash macabre London so I can personally welcome you to the ghoul gang. And lastly, thanks very much to Magic Mind for sponsoring this episode. Make sure you check them out and don't forget your discount code macabre London for your 50% off a subscription or 20% off a one time purchase. Again, all the details will be in the show notes. Thanks for joining me for another macabre mini mystery from around the world. I've been Nikki Druce. Remember to stay spooky and I'll see you ghouls next time. Bye.